I think, I think Brian built a lot of this stuff. Didn't you? Yeah. I mean, imagine what his battle bot arenas are like. You have a volcano in one of them. That's what you should like be part of the deal. You know, that's a, yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool. All right. Um, the title of today's sermon is a word for the worried. And it comes from Matthew six verses 24 through 34. And, um, we, whether we realize it or not, we are rapidly descending down the side of the, the other side of the mountain when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the mountain climb took us a little bit to get through the Beatitudes and the Torah and piety, but um, once we hit the Lord's Prayer, we've just descended quickly. And so this is the last really passage that talks about the greater righteousness that Jesus calls for, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. You'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So um, we are greater righteousness and wealth. When you look at this um, uh, triangle diagram of how this this section of scripture is structured. And so we've probably got two or three more sermons. I mean, that's how quickly it moves from greater righteousness and our outside relations in the offering of two ways. So a word for the worried, Matthew 6, 24 through 34. Let's read it and then, um, then I'll pray. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or material things. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for your word. Um, We're thankful for the simplicity of this passage of scripture as far as being able to read it and understand it, Lord. And we just pray for the ability to, to, to live this out. God, it's, I think it's something easy for us to comprehend, but it's something very difficult to live, especially when we get in the middle of life and all of its pressures, Lord, and trying to provide for a family and, and um, trying to look after the future of a, of a family, trying to provide for ourselves, Lord, and just we just ask for your grace and your mercy to be upon us as we, um, as we seek to look to you and to put you first, Lord, in the middle of our lives, in the center of our lives, and as we seek your kingdom and your righteousness. I pray for myself as I preach that you would help this to be a helpful message today, not only for me, but also for those who hear. And we pray that um, people will put their faith in you and will come to know who you are through the gracious, uh, your graciousness and your goodness that you demonstrate here in our lives and in, and in this this text. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, depending on your mental makeup, you may or may not be someone who is prone to anxiety, right? Um, I know that I, I am. I'm, I'm a person that can um, worry, not as much as um, some other people, but it kind of runs in my, kind of runs in my family. It's kind of our genetic makeup, you know? Um, and there is a genetic predisposition to the amount of worry that we can experience in this life. But what Jesus does here in Matthew 6, verses uh, 24 through 34, he really kind of cuts to the heart of the matter, um, which is there is a way to live in this world that, you know, is a little bit out of this world. And um, if you live this way, it, it helps greatly with the feeling of anxiousness or worry. In other words, You might have to be on medication for your anxiety. <laughs> you might have to go to the doctor and, 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 and take some medicine. Um, but in this fallen world in which we live, there's also 
passages like this. Um, and the, the therapy, for lack of a better term, that comes from God's word, the truth of it, when it's applied, can actually help with that feeling of anxiety that some of us feel as well. And so um, we're not arguing for an, an either or kind of view to this, but rather a both and, right? This is meant to be our guiding post, our light to the way the world works, the world in which we live, how we view it through the Christian lens and what we know of God's righteousness and his kingdom. And, um, and there are other helps that God has put in place too in his gracious wisdom in a fallen world to help us overcome some of these worries. worries. But this is, I think, probably the most definitive word on worry from God that you'll get. I mean, the son of God comes in Matthew 6, verses 24 through 34, and cuts right to the, the heart of the matter. It's really a beautifully crafted section of scripture, because if you look at it, it's worry is placed at the very beginning of the teaching, it's placed in the middle of the teaching, and then it concludes the teaching in Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious or worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Look at verse 31, Matthew chapter six. Um, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? And then you look at verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. And so you've got this, you know, this beautiful um, symmetry that occurs in this, this teaching here, it's a beautifully written passage of script, scripture. Um, and it is just really God's, that's why I say it's God's definitive word on the issue of worry. And what Matthew 6, 24 through 34 really highlights is that material possessions, all right, or having what you think you need in this life to get on or to survive are not the prescription for anxiety. Um, rather, over-reliance of these things is the cause of most of our anxiety. There's a lot of irony in these verses, especially if you look at verses 19 through 24, right? The verses that talk about don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The, the folks that are laying up for themselves treasure on earth the things that we think will take our anxiety away are actually accumulating things that are making them more anxious. And it makes sense, right? I mean, look what Timothy says, or Paul says to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So, it makes sense that the people that live their life to get some sort of inner peace from the things that they have are filled with anxiety because the things that they are putting into their lives that they're focusing on are what Paul calls uncertain. Riches are uncertain. They are like a waterless rain cloud in the middle of a drought in summer. Outside of you, you can plan, you can manage, you can do the very best that you can do. But as Micah will tell you, nothing is bulletproof when it comes to wealth or finances. There's, there's no sure thing. There's not a sure thing. They're uncertain, which is why intuitively, and then this is the thing, <laughs> I call it a poverty mindset. You can have a poverty mindset and be extremely wealthy. But the poverty mindset says, right, I have to have the certain things in my life to bring some sort of inner joy or peace or confidence to take care of other people, to take care of my own family. And usually these people take care of themselves last. But the poverty mindset usually exists because if, let's say that you, you don't come from a family that has a lot, right? And you come from poverty and you actually make it, and then you have an abundance of wealth. It's really hard to get rid of the mindset that you had when you didn't have anything. And so there's this, this terrible insecurity that, that well, you think that you'll lose it, 
right? You can't trust anybody with it. Someone's always out to get you. You, don't, you. If you stop, everything will crumble. Everything, the whole world rides on your shoulders. No one understands, right? How many people are responsible for, you're responsible for in your, in your success. And those are all legitimate concerns. I can't imagine what it would be like to employ people whose livelihood depends on something that I've built or something that the Lord has allowed me to have, right? There's just this great deal of stress that comes. There's a great deal of anxiety that comes from being wealthy. And us poor people just don't get it. Well, God does. (laughs) Which is why he cuts right to the heart of the mindset that's at play here, right? And and that's the first thing to know is that material possessions are not the prescription for anxiety. Actually, they are the cause of rich people's anxieties and of poor people's anxieties. And so what Jesus does here is he sets forth a different worldview, a worldview that says God is in charge of this global and local economy. God is responsible for providing the needs of every single person that you employ. And if you're employed, your needs, it's God, not these other people. And what people will find is that if they seek righteousness in God's kingdom and reign and rule in a spirit of humility and trust, that they will actually walk into the things that their anxiety is just so hard word, they'll, they'll act, the things that they think need to happen will happen, but they'll find them when they stop looking for them. And so it's, it's a different way to live in, in the world. Material possessions are not the prescription for anxiety. Actually, overliance on them is the cause. The antidote for worry is a kingdom-centered life. Guess what? Your people, the people that, if you don't have anything, right? Like, if you have little, one of the things you'll think is, well, if, I don't know if anybody ever, who's, who's played this game? We're going to have a moment of honesty in here, right? Who's played the Powerball game? Like, not, not for real. I'm not asking you if you bought a ticket. Who's played it in their mind? What would I do if I won the Powerball game? Oh, man, how much is it? Who knows? Somebody knows what the. Johnson, no, it's just 870 million. One of the reasons we play the Powerball game, right, is because, man, that's a whole psychoanalysis could be done on that. But it's because you get to fool yourself into thinking that you're generous, you know? Well, I take care of my parents, and I take care of here, and I give a couple of million to the church. And, you know, so we get to fool ourselves into thinking that we're really generous. <laughs> so we, we fail to see that if, you know, things don't, nothing, things don't change, right? Right? It's not, you know, you, you don't, generosity is not tied to what you have. It's tied to the condition and the posture of your being and your, in your, person. And so generous people are generous people, whether they have a lot or don't have anything, right? But we get to pretend that we'd be generous. And then we would think, then we think, okay, what would I do with the money? And then suddenly any anxiety that you might have based on that, that comes from not having what you think you need is temporarily removed because you've created a world that you can exist in. It's a fictitious future oriented existence to where you have the very thing that you think that you need, namely money to solve all the things that bring your worry and your anxiety, your your problems. And that's why it's such a fun exercise to, to do, you know, and Beth and I'll do it. And uh, we, we have, we do that in the car sometimes. And she, um, she always, she's really good at telling me where to put my, I'll say, I'm going to do this. And she's like, that's dumb. You need to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll do that then. So I don't have, you know, probably one of the reasons I haven't won the Powerball yet because, well, I don't play. But, um, and I'm not knocking the people. I'm not, this isn't about gambling. This is, um, but. <laughs> the antidote for anxiety is a kingdom-centered life. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first God, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So. 
Well, let's start Matthew 6, 24, work through it. We got plenty of time. No one can serve two masters. For he'll hate the one and love the other. He'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, and mammon. This, is a, this verse is structured beautifully as well. Um, and it's hard. It doesn't come out in English um, because the no one can and the you cannot. But in Greek, those are the same words. And so this, this, this verse is bookended with inability. You are unable to serve two masters. You are unable to serve God and money. Uh, it really highlights the person's inability to function in that way. And that's so important. We talked about it last week. I'm not going to talk about it much this week because a lot of us fool, fool ourselves into thinking that we can. I have a really good friend of mine. I'm not going to name his name because I don't want to embarrass him. And no, no one will know who he is anyway. But um, he has double-sided business cards. And on one business card, one side it has so-and-so, so-and-so with Remax Legacy. And the other one, it says, um, so-and-so sides auto body and repair. Y'all won't know who he is. <laughs> I picked on his brother Patrick last week because I said, you can't really give out, you can't give out two business cards, right? Think about, think about this concept. If you're giving out a business card, right, you have a 15, 20 second shot, maybe. You don't have time for two. You don't. Um, and even on the double-sided one, right, it doesn't work. JJ told me somebody will call him and they'll say, uh, hey, man, you got your uh, auto body business card? I got your business card, but it's the one for the real estate. And Jonathan says, he'll tell him, I'll just flip it over. <laughs> there it is. And so it's really hard to serve two masters, right? And so it's, you're, it's impossible. And that's what Jesus, uh, Jesus is trying to teach us. It's book ended with incapability here. Um, but there's also something to, of interesting to note too, is that he wants us to correlate serving money and serving God and to compare them, which is a very interesting concept to think about. Because it begs the question, how can you serve money? Well, I mean, you can't serve money by cleaning its house, right? Or picking it up from the hospital. But I'll be right there, money. I'm coming to get you, right? Or pouring it a cup of coffee. And you can't serve God that way either. The point, I think, is the, the way that we serve money is by the way we orient our lives around what money does for us, all right? We serve money by actually trusting money and putting money in a position to where it meets our needs. That's how we serve money, okay? And so, and that's why I use the word orient our life around. Because when we serve money or when we serve material goods to meet the needs that we have, the single-minded, focus-driven kingdom that we are in is that of mammon. And so we utilize money to work for us. We invest money to work for us so that we can get sick, we can buy medicine. And so that when it turns cold, we can buy a coat. And so that when it, we get hungry, we can purchase food. That's how we serve money. And what Jesus is saying is, over here, right, in a position of almost opposition is him. There is no other rival, right, that poses as a greater threat to, we're going to, this is parentheses because there's no threat to God, right, to God than money. Because Money allows us to do for ourselves everything that God says he'll do for us. God says, if you're hungry, I'll feed you. If you're thirsty, I'll give you something to drink. If you're naked, I'll clothe you. If you're sick, I'll heal you. I'm your great physician. I will be there for you. From your birth to your old age, I'll carry you. And money comes along and it says, I can do the same things. You, when you get sick, we'll buy medicine. We'll get you the best doctors. We'll fly you wherever you need to. Are you hungry? You can eat whatever you want. You want some clothing? It'll be the best of the best. If you need a house to live in, you can buy a house with me. And so then you have, you have these two rival deities 
in our lives, namely God and money. And Jesus knows this. And he comes to a people, right? And the, what has been the single-minded message behind the Sermon on the Mount? It is devotion, single-minded devotion to Yahweh. That's why he says, if your eye's generous, your body's full of light. If it's evil, it's full of darkness. And if the light is in you, it's darkness. How great is that darkness? What he's saying is, we're calling for a completely upside down, kingdom oriented philosophy to life. And one of the things that comes in up against this kingdom center philosophy is the way we use money. And you can't serve God in money the same way. That's what Jesus is saying. This isn't a condemnation for people that have money. It's not. This isn't a condemnation for people that are wealthy. It's not. It's a call for everyone, regardless of their economic status, to live a certain way. And you could be poverty-minded and have it all, and you could be poverty-minded and have nothing, which is why Paul says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul sees no difference in the two. He sees danger on both sides. And the thing that keeps him grounded is a singular focused pursuit of the righteousness of God's kingdom. And so that's what we read about next. Let's look at this. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Since you cannot serve two masters, right? When you, when you go on the road to serving two, you're incapable of doing it. Incapable. Someone will always forget that your, your main focus is on the other side of your double-sided business card. They'll always forget it, right? It's impossible. I'm not, and I don't want Jonathan, no, and me and JJ are best friends, and he knows. I told him when, when Pat said, first thing Pat said after the sermon was, I mean, my brother has double-sided business cards. You didn't even mention him. And I said, well, I'll get him on a PowerPoint and put him up there. But it's such a great little illustration of just being human. There's a therefore there, and here's what it's there for. I'm going to tell you something. Don't be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So don't be anxious. You can't serve two masters. So here's, don't be anxious. And then don't be anxious because about the things I'm talking about. Is there not more to life than the stock market or your portfolio or what's hanging in your closet or what's in your cupboard? Is, are those the things that you're going to use or how much inventory is in your store or whatever? Is, is that what you're going to use? to determine success. Is that what this life is really about? Jesus is hitting on something really important here, right? First Corinthians 6, 13. Stomach is meant for food and the food for stomach. The stomach. I eat whatever I want. Just eating. The body's not made for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. What, what Jesus, Paul is pressing into what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 6 is that there's, we're created for something else. We're, we're not created just to make sure that our closets are full and our cupboards are stacked, right? We're not made. He didn't make us for bigger barns. There's, there's something more to life. There, there's something more to our existence. We exist with one life, one. You don't get another one. This one's it, man. You don't get another set of kids. You shouldn't get another spouse. Right? I mean, you won. This is it. And, and Jesus presses home here and he goes, are you living your life? Your, when you wake up every day, the routine that you go through, is, does that reflect your recognition of what life is about? Or is it part of an anxiety-driven rat race to make sure everyone's where they need to be, doing what they're supposed to do, where I need to be, what I'm supposed... Like, which one, is it driven by peace? Is your morning routine driven by peace? Or if I don't do these things, they won't happen. Anxiety. 
What Jesus is after here is not that you change your morning routine, but that a certain mindset, right, be present in whatever that routine is. And so if you've got to make sure 35 people get, get to 35 different places, and that's part of your routine for running your business, Jesus will say, there's nothing wrong with making sure the 35 people get there. What I want to know is what drives your doing. Is it anxiety, angst, fear, doubt, failure, got to live up to this, got to be, or is it a single-minded focus that I trust God with every part of this business? I trust God with my family. I trust God with my coming and going. I trust him to meet my needs. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm not going to look at the result. This is what Nick Saban would say. I'm not going to look at the result. I'm going to focus on the process. We're not going to have the fear of failure and anxiety drive us. It's not a good driving factor. We have to have kingdom-oriented priorities. Your life was meant for something more than just this. Don't waste it worrying. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. They don't buy. Those coolers that my grandmother owns, some of you, what do you call them? Deep freeze. Birds don't buy deep freezer. You don't ever see them in Lowe's at the appliance desk buying a deep freeze because they just slaughtered a cow that's going to feed the family through the winter, right? And, not, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what Jesus is saying is, is like, look, these folks don't have anything. These birds, they don't have a barn. Now, this isn't a license for laziness. You ever seen a bird get after some food? Boy, they, they work that ground to death. But it's there. But your heavenly father feeds them every day. Every day, birds go out. They go, they go get their food on the daily. And are you not more valuable than a bird? In any way, which one of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? You can't, right? You can take hours away from your life by being anxious, but you can't add anything to it. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. What's the function of a lily in a field? Does anybody know? What is their function? To look pretty. You just sit there and look pretty. If you're ever helping somebody on a construction project, and they say that to you like they do to me. <laughs> That's right. I saw, we saw a board, a, a, um, an advertisement in Decatur the other day. It said, general helpers needed. And I said, That's me. Because anytime I help somebody with a project, they're like, hey, hey, Jeremiah, uh, bring me that screwdriver. Or, hey, Jeremiah, hey, hold this right here. Just, yeah, just hold, okay, yeah. You know, that's what lilies do. They sit there and they look pretty. And yet Solomon and even all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God clothes the lilies of the field which absolutely serve almost zero purpose except to look pretty, right? He closed them. Today they exist. Tomorrow they're thrown into the oven. And the most ostentatious monarch that you can think of when they go to, to, to dye their garments and to make up their, their view of royalty, they don't even come close to how God's clothed a worthless flower. That's what Jesus is saying. This is the, that is the upside downness of kingdom reality. He treats the flowers like royalty. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you have little faith. Therefore, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? 
And here's the reason. Number one, the Gentiles seek after all these things. The same Gentiles when he said, hey, when you pray to God, don't pray in public and utter many sayings because the Gentiles think that they're going to be heard by God for all their babblings. This is why they babble. They're driven by anxiety. They're driven by met needs. And they don't go to God in a posture of a child knowing that the father will meet the child's needs. They go to God like he's some sort of cosmic bellhop that they can summon with their abundance of words to do the things they need him to do and to take care of the things they need him to take care of. And he says, you don't go to God that way. Don't worry. People outside the kingdom worry. That's their lot. You've been purchased by a king. He reigns over you in righteousness. He gave his life for you. That is not what God has for you. Christ did not die for you to exist that way. That's their kingdom. This is yours. Worry doesn't exist here. Don't be anxious. Gentiles. Worry exists, but not Not the kind of worry that's just driven by faithlessness in God. Gentiles do that. That's for the first reason not to worry. Here's the second. And your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. And as we're going to read about in Matthew 7, I mean, if we being evil can give good gifts to our children, will the Lord, who's perfect, not lavish us with good gifts? Here's the antidote. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Jesus says some weird things in the gospel. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This right here is the key to finding the thing that we need. You find the Lord's provision when you stop looking for it. And that's a really difficult concept to grasp. Another way to put it is you stop pressing. You ever try to coach a kid at a sport and they're trying too hard, they're pressing? You say, hey, back off a little bit. Try easy. Try easy. And then suddenly it clicks, right? Or you do something for the love of it. And then you find yourself in the middle of something that's wildly successful beyond your own imagination. And you weren't setting out for it to be successful. You were doing it for the love of that thing. And you, in, the, in the love of the thing you were doing, you found a million things that you didn't even know were there. That's the way it works when we seek Christ's kingdom. We seek that. It's a single-minded focus for his righteousness and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. We don't spend too much time thinking about the not yet. We're already here in the already as he brings us back to. And as we walk in that path, we find in our pursuit of that, the things in the flourishing that the whole world worries about. And it's really hard to describe this unless you've just lived it. But that's the way it works. We start to find things the minute we don't care whether or not we lose them. And then he goes on to say this, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the last point. I'm running out of time quickly. One, a tenant of living in God's kingdom, pursuing his righteousness is that we are people who live in the moment. Um, and that's probably one of the most underlooked verses in this whole a lot of commentators don't even know if it should be there. That's what they say. They don't even, because it kind of doesn't, you know, it's like an addition to the end. But it's, it's, to me, it's the linchpin. Because so much of anxiety is spent doing the opposite of Powerball. One of the reasons that we like to do the Powerball exercise is it takes us out of the moment. You don't have to be in the moment. 
You get to be in an imaginary world where you have the solution to all your problems. And what Jesus says, right, is that anxiety, this is how crazy it is, is exactly the same place the people that are doing the money ball are living on the, in the same place as the people who are worried about what they will eat or what they will drink or what they will wear. They're both, most of the time, in the future. They're not in today. They're in the future. And what God does, what Christ does in his kingdom is he comes to every person, even the ones that are in the most financially dire straits. He says, do you have food today? Do you have clothing? Yeah. You have places? Yeah. Okay. But I don't know what I'm doing about tomorrow. What's tomorrow? It doesn't exist. Tomorrow doesn't exist. And that's, I don't know if I can, I've heard people, Jeremy, I don't know if I can do this for 10 years. My response is always, well, God's not asking you to do it for 10 years. He's just asking you to do it today. You don't know. You don't know. And that's what this text gets at. It's not against planning for the future, but what it does is it just highlights the absolute reality that it's not there yet. That today, you have today. And there's so much for your attention today that you don't really have the time to waste on tomorrow. Whether you're worrying about whether or not it's going to be good or whether you're in the imaginary land that gives you the solution to make it good. The kingdom of God brings us back to the moment and says, you have right now. The only person that exists in the not yet is Yahweh. That's it. Everybody else, you are confined. Boom. And what the good news of the gospel does is it, is it gives us the reason that citizens of his kingdom don't have to worry about tomorrow. And it's because the king came down, put on flesh, died on a cross, and took away the thing that we really ought to be worried about. Namely, we have ticked off in our ignorance and pursuit of other things and our idolatry a God who demands our absolute allegiance. And there's wrath for us. That's another ironic part of Matthew 6, 24 through 34. All of humanity is worried about the wrong thing. And God in Christ has taken away his wrath from the people that are in his kingdom. And that is the source of the cessation of our anxiety. What do we really have to be anxious about? Tomorrow is not real yet. And when it becomes real, our status doesn't change. Unchangeable. Fixed in the heavens. Period. That's the good news of the gospel. And so Jesus comes to people that are in the kingdom, that are trying to live in his kingdom the way they live in other kingdoms. And he goes, hey, this, it doesn't compute. It's not the same. You have a different king a different righteousness, a different pursuit, a different goal, a different single-minded focus. You can't be, you can't be like, when I was, man, when I was like 10, 11, 12, 13, I was a kid that worried. And I remember my mom and dad being like, hey, Jeremiah, be careful with your glasses. We have terrible eye insurance. Okay, so I moved to contacts then, right? Well, I didn't, I didn't, I was concerned. We didn't have good eye insurance. And so if I'd rip a contact and I didn't have any left, you know what I would do? I would put a contact in one eye and leave the other one the way it was, all right? So I would go and play baseball and, you know, my dad would find out five or six games into the season that I'd been playing with one contact for five or six weeks. 
He's like, no wonder you're not hitting it like you want to. You can't see. Well, that's the way we do in the kingdom, right? We put in one contact and we say, all right, this is God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then we go to bat with the other eye, right? So we got one good eye and we got one bad eye. And Jesus says, you have no good eyes. And he comes in and he puts contacts in both. And he says, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, because you can see now. That's the good news of the gospel. And if you're not a child of God, my invitation to use it, as, um, as Jonathan said, repent and believe the gospel. Or maybe it was Jackson. Repent and believe the gospel. You can have eternal life. Stop batting with one contact in and being legally blind with the other eye. You're not going to hit anything. Two good eyes. Christians, two good eyes. Let's reprioritize our kingdom values. Let's fight worry and anxiety with all the good gifts that God has given us to employ therapy, medicine, learning techniques to cope, but also with the gospel that we have a savior who died, took on flesh so that we can live worry-free in his kingdom. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the way you love us. Thank you for your word. Build us up by it, God. Convert the lost strengthen the believing. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.